Welcome to the keynote stage. So my name is Mark Walsh. I'm the founder of this conference and part of the leadership team with Daniela and Manel. We have got quite a feast, quite a treat installed for you. The main stage doesn't have all the top names on. Some of them are spread out for various logistical reasons, but there are some awesome presenters on this stage. This stage is also sponsored by Alain Stefani. When we first had the idea of getting sponsors, I basically said, I won't take anyone as a sponsor unless I love what they do, because otherwise it, it doesn't have any integrity for me. I didn't know who Alain Stefani was, but I met her in Berlin. Someone said, oh, she's an intimacy teacher, she's an ex-sex worker, best-selling author in Germany. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet her. And I met her, and as soon as I met her, I felt at ease. I felt like, wow, this is a person who's playful, but also a deep listener. This is a, a woman who's a real leader. Uh, since I've seen her work uh, with people in very, you know, around trauma, around intimacy, around very difficult areas, men and women, I've come to regard her as a friend, actually. Like, I love her. So go to her website and check it out. It's Alan, I-L-A-N, Stefani, S-T-E-P-H-A-N for November I, alanstefani.com. There's an offer there called Love and Rage, which is as juicy as it sounds. You'll also find links in the descriptions uh, for the videos below. Hello everyone, welcome to the Embodiment Conference. My name is Mark, I'm your host for this evening, though Alanis Morissette will be asking most of the questions this evening. So just a practical <laughs> thing, first of all, if you're worried about missing out, if you don't stay up all late, you can get the whole library, which we're doing a special bonus package with at the moment. Uh, two things that are special about it at the moment. One is that if you are a trauma educator and you cannot afford it, if you are a trauma educator, you're working with traumatized populations, email us. We'll give you either a discount or the whole thing for free. So we want to put that out there. Uh, second one is there's some bonuses that are with it at the moment for everyone, uh, including one from Stephen Porges, who you're probably aware of. Okay, so without further ado, Ilanis Morissette, you might know her from her music which I'm sure you love as much as I do. You might know her from her films. Uh, you may know her from her podcast where she knowledgeably uh, interviews some of the top trauma people in the world. And when, when I heard her on the podcast, I was like, cool, we need to get her in. This will be great. Um, she's a very, as someone that does a lot of interviews myself, I'm impressed with her interviewing. So I'm very happy to take a back seat as she <laughs> introduces Dan Segal, interpersonal neurobiologist, which I think he invented as a thing and is an amazing concept that I think we'll hear more about. Professor of Psychiatry at UCLA School of Medicine and Executive Director of the Mindsight Institute. Really enjoyed hearing Dan last night, so I'm gonna be on the couch listening to this one. So Alanis, over to you. Okay, hi, thanks for having. Um, Dan Siegel. <laughs> I'm a stickler for pronunciation, if nothing. Um, so, yeah, I have had the pleasure of sharing the stage with Dan, sitting in the audience with Dan, reading your books as a mom. It's a huge deal. Um, the, ma the many books you've written with uh, Tina. Um, and so I'm so grateful to you. And just on a purely social, relational level, I just consider you a friend. And I'm, uh, I feel blessed to know you, Dan. Thanks for being I, here. I I feel the same about you, Alanis, and you know, it's, um, it's great to be here with you and the journey we've had together, starting meeting at a relational gathering and then having a friendship develop and then having the opportunity to teach a few times, you know, it's, mm -hmm. really, it's really fantastic. So I'm excited about this conversation and uh, I think we're interviewing each other <laughs> you know, in this gathering. Not always the case, the conversation. <laughs> Yeah. And I think one of the themes, I mean, many themes that we talked about banding about, um, one of them was the idea of clearly the embodiment conference. So talking about in, inhabiting the body and embodiment. And I remember once you saying, maybe it was your daughter who said that, um, what was the term that you used where you said embodied self or you said- Oh, you, the embodied you, brain. The embodied, the embodied brain. brain. Um, so really talking about embodiment, embodied brain, embodied, you know, what is the capital S soulful spiritual self where's that seat localized i'm really fascinated too with the idea of <clears throat> where the localization of perception comes from too like where is the seat of the soul as such so mm -hmm. i don't know if any of the if any of those topics um could kick start a conversation that we typically have that'd be great so where's yeah. the soul localized well, absolutely the yeah so you know i mean <laughs> when the embodiment folks asked <laughs> if we could do something uh and we were chatting about it, I think one of the things that emerged was 
how do we blend like the direct experience people have and for you as a composer and a and a songwriter and a musician and a you know performer in mm. that art form you have to be in touch with your body mm. literally to sit with the pain to sit with the joy to sit with the confusion to try to get the clarity mm. i think a lot of people know you as the the wonderful musician you are so that to start there and say you know how does that act of creation that comes through your body mm. find its way then out into the recording studio or on the stage mm. so that i have heard so many people including one of my old assistants who said you totally transformed their lives and i the, one of the first times you came to our institute and she was still working with us i said okay you can come to lunch with alanis and me and, we're, and she sat next to you she was going oh my god i can't believe this because you were really this incredible person in her life where your music reached into her body just to stay with the body theme, you know, and she felt liberated from some path she was on and the words you chose in the poetry that are your lyrics and the music that surrounds and gives literally embodiment to the poems, the, mm -hmm. the lyrics, you yes. know, changed her. So I'm going to actually start with a question of embodiment for you. I love it. That when, you're, when you think about your career, and I know you've been through so many developmental phases, but starting <laughs> really in your adolescence, mm. when music became a space of reality um, to even now, where your last album, the, the album you just put out, is mm -hmm. phenomenal and different. Right. It's yeah. and I'm I'm thinking especially about the song Her on that mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. And and but I could ask you about any of them. Uh mm -hmm. you know, tell us a little bit about how your body has played a role over all these decades of songs finding their way through you out to the world to really heal. Mm. First of all, thank you. That is a, a lot of reflection. I talk a lot about the stage of development of mirroring and how um, vitalizing it is to reflect to each other in words what we see. You know, not in an interpret not in an interpreting way, but more in a here's what I'm seeing. And you just do that so generously. So, yay for mirroring and specifically being mirrored by you, Dan. Is is very yeah. um, it's energizing. So thank you. And um, it also creates a sense of identity. I think it's a stage of development that is under talked about, as well as our how egregiously under touched we are as a society. But mm -hmm. um, so the process for the songwriting and the, and the body part is is the the first moment is of being in a state of true receptivity to hear the music and to allow it to move through me in in a in a current kind of way. So first, I have to be really responsible for the current. You know, because if I sublimate it, I get sick. If I over over dramatize it and act it out, you know, it's not great for my relationships. Um, but in art, there's this invitation and this freedom to express oneself. And in my case, I express myself with zero censorship. So, and you said it so sweetly yesterday. Sometimes the the music is in direct almost conflict and dissonance to what the the narrative or the story is about, but they're written at the same time. So I really, my, my job is to keep this brain ready and the hand and the pen and everything ready. It's very long hand, very physical for me. I can't type lyrics. I can type them later, but while I'm in process, I can't. Um, and then whatever the song or the narrative is asking of me, that's, that's what I embody, certainly when I perform it. Um, and there's so much energy sometimes. A lot of people have made note of the use of my hands on stage in ways that I'm not even always aware of but just that the energy has to go somewhere. So um, certainly it can go somewhere by running around the stage and moving and being really fueled and imbued by life source animating energy, right? So, so there's a humility and a feminine receptivity that begins the process. And then there's the physicalization of it on the stage. And the best part of it for me is that it's one thing if I were given this permission and this support to keep, to keep doing this in, in front of people and monologizing, but I see it as this energetic dialogical experience where people are in the audience and they're being given permission or at the very least an invitation to join in the movement 
that emotions and stories and narratives, what, what movement is actually being dictated or at least um, asked for with what's being sung. So I look out and I see people giving themselves permission to cry or permission to jump up and down and rage or scream or whatever it is. So in some ways, I remember years ago, a magazine referencing that it was stadium therapy or something like that. <laughs> I took that as a compliment because I was like, wow, imagine. Um, so yeah, the process is a masculine and feminine receptive and then a fire, you know, the fire, the passion that allows me to be an activist and labeled as having been an angry white female on the cover of Rolling Stone. I was like, thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I love, you know, I think anger gets a bad rep. I think it's usually sort of associated with the destructive actings out and murder and war and guns and death. Mm -hmm. and, but anger itself is this gorgeous, gorgeous life force energy that can yeah. move worlds and can write and can, um, you know, vote and be an activist and show up in all kinds of forms. So absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, two, two, a bunch of things arise in me, but one is just to stay with the body theme. You know, mm -hmm. an old colleague named Yak Panksep, who passed mm -hmm. away recently wrote a book, uh, several books, and you know, I've, I've edited a series of books on this field I work in called Interpersonal Neurobiology. And one of Yock's mm -hmm. books really dives deeply into three networks below the cortex, so we call them subcortical, that are very much connected to the body. But one of them is the anger circuit. Mm -hmm. Another one is the network of fear. And another is the network of separation, distress, which is a little bit like sadness, but sadness isn't exactly the word for it, but it's sort of sadness, separation, distress. Yeah, so anger, yeah, disconnection, disconnection, distress, uh, yes. and then fear, and then anger. And anger in some ways, you know, is that state created when there's a wrong that needs to be righted. And it's mm -hmm. not about destruction. It's actually about construction and repairing things yes. that are wrong. So, you know, the anger that in some of your songs, uh, I, someone mentioned Jagged Little Pill yesterday, you know, you can feel the anger there, but it felt, and, and now this is the question I want to ask you, you know, felt very integrative, where integration is this notion defined very clearly um, by mm -hmm. the differentiation of parts and the linkage. Mm -hmm. So we had Dick Schwartz with us yesterday, and you could see Dick's entire IFS internal family systems work, which is such a great form of therapy, you know, to look at how you differentiate the different parts of yourself and then link them. And other forms of therapy like EMDR or even Peter Levine's somatic experiencing or Pat Ogden's sensory motor work, all of these can be seen with the overarching theme of integration when it's impaired is unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. And the process of integration is healing trauma or anything else. So I want to ask you in your songwriting, do you feel that there's a kind of chaos or rigidity that may be resting there, which is when integration is impaired, that somehow when you pick out the differentiated components, even if they seem not to be going together, like in Nemesis, for example, or these other songs, you know, you get this. Um, or for me, you know, when I was listening to her, there was just such this amazing way that you allowed me to go into what was missing and then what emerges in your relationship with this new person, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that juxtaposition felt like I was differentiating your experience. And then, of course, it resonated with my own. And so it felt very healing just to be listening to that. But I wonder if integration defined as linking different differentiated parts feels like it's some aspect of the embodiment of this creative journey you've been on all these years? Uh, yes, and, and, and really what that begs the question of for me is to really take a step before integration because integration to me seems like the pay dirt or the pay off for a certain amount of work, a certain amount of disidentification. And really I would love to speak briefly about the space, right? Because if there's a through line, um, through all these beautiful teachers, Pat Ogden's work, Peter Levine, IFS, Gabor, you, um, all, the, all the teachers and mentors who've, who've become friends in some ways, I feel so blessed about that. It's um, if there's a through line and a thread of continuity, it's that there's some space. So even differentiation 
implies to me space. Um, mm -hmm. The slow pace with which some, some of the somatic experience almost mandatorily has to go from to do the bottom up experience. So much space and the invitation to slow things down and really um, gain clarity about them. So for me, integration is almost like part three or part seven or part two in a multiple step process. So I really wanna get into that with you because I love your use of the word integration and I would just love to disassemble and just kind of deconstruct the journey of integration because it sounds like such a great idea intellectually. And when I try to explain it, sometimes I, um, I'm just like, God, where's Dan to brainstorm this one? With me? Because, <laughs> Let's do it. You know, you say, you say uh, chaos and rigidity, which I love. And in our family, we just, whenever we notice that one of us is on that end, we just go extremes, extremes, <laughs> I mean, yeah. extremes. you know, and that's where the addictive tendencies and the, you know, our lives, our nervous systems, none of them are, you know, none of those parts of us are meant to sit on the edge of, in your, in your terms of chaos and rigidity. We're not, yeah. long-term well-being is not afforded to us if we stay there, right? It kind of takes the body out inevitably. So, so if that's where we're starting in some ways, because it is very young, right? The black and white chaos rigidity, it's very um, survivalist. It's very animal to me. Mm -hmm. It's do or die, you know? So, so would you say, I mean, the process of differentiating developmentally is the, is the developmental process of becoming individuated. The spiritual version of that and sort of growing up and moving away from caregivers or parents, you know, the spiritual version of that is really realizing, we talked about this, the felt sense in the body. What is that? How can we achieve the, the direct experience of self and integration in the body? Where's that seat? And what precedes integration? You know, and I know that's a, <laughs> that'll be a longer <laughs> conversation than we have time for. But if we want, yeah. if you're up standing about with me, the, yeah. the, the one or two or 25 steps that lead up to integration, I, I think. Yeah, be fun. absolutely. Yeah. And, and so we can begin this and then take it on one of our, our walks around and, and deepen it too. <laughs> um, and we can certainly address it in the Q&A. You know, to back up just a sec, you know, as we talk about integration, it's helpful to really take a step back and say, well, fine, how are you defining it? Well, okay, differentiation and then linking the differentiated parts. And the key thing is when you link them, they don't lose their uniqueness, the differentiated parts. So an example would be um, you and your child in a relationship or you and me in a friendship. You know, mm -hmm. it would be we would differentiate. And then as we link with compassionate communication, we don't lose our differentiated nature. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're defining relational integration. In in the body, when you just even begin with the sperm and egg, you have differentiated sperms and egg coming, what are called gametes, from the mother and from the father. They come together. I don't want to shock anybody, but you know, they come Wait together. A minute. <laughs> <laughs> and in coming together, it's absolutely amazing. You have these differentiated genetic materials and differentiated forms that then become linked, right? Mm -hmm. And they do come together. So you have your, your genetic composition. The one cell that's formed becomes two and then four and then eight and 16, et cetera, until there becomes this incredible moment when these cells, which are pretty much identical, mm -hmm. right? Not differentiated, now have a moment when the glob is so big some cells are on the outside and some are on the inside. Mm -hmm. So that's a very special moment early in development when differentiation just by geometry has to happen, right? Who's on the in inside? Order to, in order to make this glob, well, you have all these cells growing, 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 pretty soon they can't all that's remain. Split. Right. They, 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 well, even this, they're always dividing, but it's so big that some are just gonna be on the inside. Right. And some are on the outside. Now, this becomes important because as the cell gets bigger, the, the, the conceptus gets bigger and bigger. There's an amazing moment when the outer layer, which is going to be your skin, pushes mm -hmm. inward to mm -hmm. become your neural tube and the brain in your head, the network of neurons around your heart and the network of neurons around your gut. So you have three brains that originated as skin cells. Hmm. Now, is that the web we're talking about? The web around the heart and the and the gut. Yeah, the, exactly. The tissue. Is it it's, is it literally the fascia, or is it 
everything. No, it's well, it, it's called the intrinsic nervous system of the heart and the intrinsic nervous system of the gut. So it's like if you think about a spider web, it's a spider web like set of connections. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, then the amazing thing is that the skin, once you're born, is going to be the interface between the inner and the outer. This ectoderm, someone's saying they weren't skin cells, but they actually are. They're ectoderm that moves inward to become neural tissue, become neurons. So mm -hmm. the ectoderm, it's true, it's not skin yet, but it, it, it's destined to become skin. And the role of skin is to be the interface of the body from the inner and the outer. And then the neural tissue is going to have that same role. How mm -hmm. do I link the differentiated inner and outer? So just to hold that spatial arrangement in place mm -hmm. and say, anytime you hear someone talking about the brain, including the, because, you know, this embodied brain that Maddie, my daughter, you know, she said, Dad, why do you call it that? I said, because we want to remind people, whenever you talk about the brain, everyone's brain, this brain, that you need to talk about the entire body. But mm -hmm. here, what we're saying mm -hmm. is there's a differentiated inner mm -hmm. and there's a differentiated outer, but they are linked together by something we need to define as what's actually being integrated, which is mm -hmm. energy flow. Mm, nice. Energy flow can have symbolic meaning and we call it energy in a formation. Like I say, hi, Alanis. And then you go, oh, Dan's saying hi, or I say bye. It's still the energy flow of sound. But if I say hi, it means one thing. Mm -hmm. If I say bye, it means something else. So now energy is in a formation that yeah. is symbolic yeah. of something. So that's called information. So when I think about your lyrics, for example, mm -hmm. it really makes a difference what the words are, it makes a difference there, how you string them together, their timing, it makes a difference in your singing them, the tone of them, like mm -hmm. high versus high, you know, it's totally different. So we have mm -hmm. all sorts of information embedded in that. And now mm -hmm. I, what I guess what I wanna say is that, to get to your question about integration, once you look at the unit being energy flow mm -hmm. and that some of it is information, and here at the conference, I did a whole embodiment movement. Then you can say, ah, that's what it is. It's energy patterns that are differentiated and then linked, whether you're looking at the left and right side of the brain, or you're looking at self states that Dick Schwartz beautifully calls parts. You know, mm -hmm. those are just brain activation states that yeah. are just differentiated and it's important to differentiate them and then link them. And the journey toward integration is also relational. Right, and multitudinous. Right? There's, there's so many ways to nurture that relational integration too, right? Totally. Um, yeah. And that's when, when, when I think about your connection with your kids, you know, it is an integrative journey you're on with them mm. to explore, like you said yesterday, but with one of your kids, let's go inside together. And he goes, oh, it's scary. Yes. You know, and then you were able to say, yeah, but I'm going to be there with you. I mean, yes. what more beautiful example of a loving, integrative parent parenting moment that develops what we call secure attachment. But it's so beautiful, that example you gave. Mm, thank you. And it's, uh, you know, you know how being a parent, I mean, I had no idea what I was getting into becoming a parent. It is just, you know, talk about an integrative experience. And Annie, mm -hmm. I mean, this, is, this is something a lot of parents already know and, and laugh at, but the idea of every stage of development that each one of them is at, the tendency to project, the tendency to have un, unawakened trauma come alive in me and for me to contain it. You know, so every night I have to process everything. And a lot of times physicalize, you know, I have a hot mat, a bio mat that I lie on every night. And there's so much growth and invitation for integration, as you call it, and for um, for profound healing, you know. And then for me to watch you, I, you said sixty percent. If you can parent sixty percent well enough, be a well, a, you know, a good enough parent, sixty percent. I don't know if you still stand by that number, Dan. But when I heard that number, I relaxed so wholly. Beautiful. <laughs> like yeah. it's actually ninety, Alanis. But um, <laughs> please don't say it is. But uh, you, I think you said something around 60. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, Yeah, no, no. But the idea is that there's no such thing as perfect parenting. Right. It's just showing up and being present. Yes. And when you, you said know. 60, I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm shooting for 97. And, you know, 
being really hard on. It's going, it's going for 97 is just a recipe for ill health, mental, mental health challenges. Yeah. I mean, it's set up to, to be that way. But I want to go back to what you were saying. So this, 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 it's almost like, you know, it's, it's the, uh, is it a roomy poem? Basically, in order to have this integration, there, it must be preceded by differentiation and a yeah. sense of separateness that we would consider to be healthy, right? Like a maturation Absolutely. process or, yeah. um, and so for me, I, I watch the, the, the state of connection, even in my family, you know, and I, and, and I call it the, the protest for disconnection when anyone's like upset or crying or it, I just, in the back of my mind, I often just reference the thought that um, this, is a, this is a protest because feeling yeah. disconnected in our bodies from each other even feeling, you know, if I feel disconnected from source or life or God or whatever the beautiful names are we want to use, or I feel disconnected in my relationships, or if I feel disconnected with these subpersonalities or parts of me, I'm walking around there feeling a, a sense of disconnect. And an adult version yeah. of protest would just be not wanting to engage, not committing, no eye contact. You know, it shows yeah. up in all kinds of forms, this disconnection. In children, it's beautifully, in my family's case, usually just loud, crying, upset, acting out, yeah. you know, in a really well, understandable way. So this, this is the amazing thing. And, you know, I wrote a whole textbook for graduate school and it's called The Developing Mind. And the third edition goes into this. But the simple thing to say is that what you're describing in your family is when things are not integrated, that is when they're not differentiated and linked, yeah. Um, block either one. You get chaos mm. or you get rigidity. So chaos is flooding, screaming, shouting, you think it's out of control. Rigidity mm -hmm. would be withdrawing, shutting down, not feeling anything. Stone and what, 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 what's that? Stonewalling or, yeah. Stonewalling, yeah, shutting off. You know. What mm -hmm. blew my mind as a therapist, a young therapist years ago, decades ago, was I said, well, this is weird. Every person I'm coming to um, get to know who comes in for therapy has no matter what they were given as a diagnosis which I don't really tune into mm -hmm. but I tune into the person and they come with chaos rigidity or both like everybody and then I started asking my teachers like what is that what is that and they kind of thought I was like they thought I was nuts you know and because right, so, you, <laughs> you, you were trying to differentiate and link those two <laughs> or something yeah what but there's a mathematics of it that says yes. things called complex systems, you know, when they're not optimizing what's called self-organization, they go to either chaos or rigidity. But when they are optimizing self-organization by differentiating and linking, yes. then yeah. you get harmony. You get mm -hmm. these five qualities of flexibility, adaptability, this spells the word faces, flexibility, adaptability, coherence, which means resilience over time, energy mm -hmm. or vitality and stability, which means reliability, mm -hmm. flexibility, adaptability, coherence, energy, and stability we emerge with integration. So to come to your, your original question, it is this beautiful unfolding when I hear you and how you're working it through in your family. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you think about a life of trying to take difficult childhood experiences and then make sense of them and literally integrate them you can go from a life of chaos and rigidity, which may have been present, for example, that drove your songs to being created early on. And now there's much more harmony because yeah. you've done the hard work of self-reflection, of relational work mm -hmm. to allow this faces flow of being a flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, stable. You know, it's a verb, it's a selfing experience. There's no noun really, it's all, we're all verbs. We want to cling to the, you know, uh, flimsy yeah. fantasy yes. one poet calls yeah. it of certainty. But you just get you are a verb, but then you're a verb that allows integration of energy patterns to arise. And you know, from a scientific point of view, it's really so far been a framework that's predicted the following things: integrative communication, whether it's in psychotherapy or in parenting leads mm -hmm. to the growth of integration in the brain and the head mm -hmm. of the people in the communication. Like their neuroplasticity, just what broadens the corpus callosum? What does it do? So you have four ways you can study this, both mm -hmm. anatomical and structural, but 
the mm -hmm. corpus callosum, just like you're saying, that connects left and right gets thicker. Yeah. You see it more integrated. The mm -hmm. hippocampus, which is linking widely differentiated areas to each other, gets mm -hmm. more robust. The prefrontal cortex just behind your forehead grows fibers that link differentiated areas. And there's something called the connectome. So the word connect with the letters O-M-E. Mm -hmm. It's more subtle ways where you can see that the differentiated parts of the brain are linked. It becomes more interconnected. And so amazing. That last, yeah. that last version you just said, um, how does that look? How does that show up? If I were to notice that that were robust and working and- Yeah, and well, one way. <laughs> so there's a study, what's that? Yeah, no, I just wanna know what it looks like if it's in fine form. <laughs> yeah, it's in fine form. Okay, cool. So, yeah. so yeah. there's a Smith and colleagues study out of 2015 that was across universities that measured every wet measure of well being relational well being, personal well being, physical well being, Express medical well being. <laughs> but <Artistic> every, well -being. <laughs> I don't know if they did artistic well being, but they measured every measure of well being. And one factor in the brain of all these people they studied predicted well being across every measure they could do. And it was how integrated your brain was. So we're talking neurons, we're talking firing together, wiring together. We're talking about oh. all the, the mechanisms and in, in functional the and structural. And the thing that's mind blowing. And energetic too, right? Energetic. Energetic for sure. You can show that in, in, in these certain it's waves you can study. If, yeah. if I just, if I told you that, look, I can teach you to focus your attention, open your awareness and actually cultivate kindness. Those three things. You and say you cultivate it's like someone can just do it. You can. <laughs> I mean, I I can, but some people okay. who are in, in some people who are mired in personality disorders that have graduated into, let's say, I don't know, narcissism or something. It's a little <laughs> tougher. It's a little tougher to access that and not to. Yeah. You know, they might so not we we can right. we can get political if you want to, but we don't have to. But, <laughs> but, but let's just yeah. But but it, but it is about personality, just like you're saying. But the, yeah. the fact is, kindness as an intention let's call this, someone's asking, can you repeat it? These three pillars are, you can cultivate focused attention, yes. open awareness and kind intention. And, and when, you, when you do that amazingly, and we call this three pillar mind training, you can show in the most rigorous scientific journals, peer reviewed mm -hmm. journals, that these are the six things you get if you train your mind that way. Um, one, you reduce stress, right? Nice. Two, you improve immune function. No question. Three, your cardiovascular system is enhanced in that high cholesterol is lowered, high blood pressure is lowered, and the way the heart in your chest communicates with the brain in your head is in a mm -hmm. much more integrative way, which you measure with something called vagal tone. We don't have to get into the technology of it, but so basically cardiovascular health is improved. That's number three. Number four, this is mind blowing. You can alter the non-DNA molecules sitting on top of the genes that control inflammation. Mm -hmm. And now we understand that inflammation is at the root of the many of the very- health. Exactly, of all these diseases. So you can reduce inflammation and number five, you can actually optimize an enzyme called telomerase that repairs and maintains the tips of the chromosomes called telomeres. Right. All that just, just length, length keeps them intact. Right. So guess what? This three pillar mind training, you can do it all with the wheel of awareness practice. So if you want to go to our website, do the wheel of awareness for free. You know, we've had lots and lots and lots of people do it. And it has all three pillars in one practice. Usually they're separate, but here's the exciting thing. You know, you are basically, and the person who discovered this won the Nobel Prize for this, Elizabeth Blackburn and her colleague, Alyssa Eppel, when they read the transcript for the book Aware, they, you know, Alyssa wrote to me, Alyssa Eppel said, hey, you got to add something. I said, what do I have to add? They said, you need to say this three pillar practice slows the aging process. No question. So this was like mind blowing. And I said, that's <laughs> audacious. How can I say it? They said, we're the world's experts in it. We got Elizabeth got a Nobel Prize in it. Yes. <laughs> so say it. So I say it only with their support, right? So yeah. so here's what I want to say, because this gets to the trauma part and integration. Mm -hmm. Yesterday you were powerfully talking about, you know, 
how any of us who've experienced adversity in childhood, it lives in the body. Mm -hmm. And I wanna really just have anyone who's been listening to those studies know that those were not intervention studies. And we now have information in the general public, not for people with adversity, but just general folks, that you get these five things improved and you get your brain becoming more integrative in all these ways we've described. That's the sixth outcome. You get a more integrated brain with three pillar practice. So that's with the general population. But there are studies that show that each of these things is damaged with trauma. Mm. So someone needs to do the study, but theoretically there's every reason to be incredibly hopeful that if you do three pillar practice and you improve the integration of your relationships, so the relational and the inner, you are going to reverse, I would bet you the study will come out, it isn't out yet, you will reverse the very mechanisms for why adversity is so damaging. And then you will then have this more robust integrative life of the faces flow, right? Flexibility, adaptability, et cetera. Yeah. So that's the good news of where we're at. And it is just like you're saying, Alana, it's, it's neuroplasticity. It's mm -hmm. where attention goes, neural firing flows mm -hmm. and neural connection grows. Where attention mm -hmm. goes is what you can do with your mind Neural firing is what you do with your mind to get your brain to fire in a certain way. And once you have neural firing, neural connection grows in very particular ways. In this case, it's integrative and things are working. Elizabeth Blackburn is the person who won the Nobel Prize. Someone's and I was thinking, right, and, and in that, that three-step pillar um, process, for me, the cultivating kindness, you know, I, I can't help but go micro and macro all the time. Um, <clears throat> and I think about cultures in general that have normalized certain sort of social constructs and, and you know perceptions of how humans are supposed to be, what genders they're supposed to be and all these indoctrinating stories, but to cultivate kindness in a culture that is slowly normalizing the disconnect in some ways and slowly normalizing um, personality disorders in ways that you know, it used to be a time where fame as a concept was something that was used as a means to an end, to serve or to make political commentary in the 60s and 70s. Um, then fame became the end, <laughs> you know, and it was this chase for the end. And, and in our culture in general, and, and this is all brought on by the idea of, you know, cultivating kindness. If we're not accessing kindness naturally, for me, it means that there's some disruption Right, so when you say cultivate kindness, you know, for me, that's often relate. The only the starting point would be relational and having a non-judgmental, safe listener across from us um, that could allow us to access the kindness that is sort of our innate essential goodness being evidenced. Mm -hmm. um, in this culture, it's become harder and harder to to go there, you know, it just seems like a really sophisticated, mature, arrived, for lack of a better term, um, capacity, you know, and, and I, I know that I watch my children and I can see kindness is just in their soul, you know, it's in their bones. And in, it's in so many of our bones, especially the, the more highly sensitive and empathic of us, you know, some of us are called, you know, some of us dip into the codependence world and the, the non-differentiated version of relational, a little more chaos in there, obviously, but but the cultivation of kindness is something, and we can talk about it now or some other time, but I I think it's something to look at. It's like, because I ask people sometimes, you know, and what would the kind part of you, you know, have to say about this? And it's hard to access the kind when we're in this bound, self-protective tigers at, at every turn or so we think, mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah. can you a little bit about your thoughts about how I mean even the word cultivate means sort of garnering or yeah activating you know and is it, you know that's, yeah, well, that's, the, <laughs> that's yeah. so beautiful let me pick up on exactly what you said you said you know when there's this self-protective stance we take things shift out of kindness so let, let's start there and you know, the idea of cultivating kindness is just like you're saying that kids may naturally have it. Although I got to tell you, kids also learn very quickly to be vulnerable. not so kind to people who are not like them. I mean, I can tell you stories that are yeah. kind of scary. So it's kind of, uh, we can get into that in a moment, but, but let's, let's actually just begin with that, that 
and I know this may sound like we're pulling things apart, but this would be a fun place for you and for me to, I think, invite everyone to go. Let's take the word self. Mm -hmm. And the word self is fascinating because you could argue like that we don't have a clear definition of it, but what some researchers suggest, it's sort of the center of subjective experience, the center Mm -hmm. of perspective, you know, how you're seeing the world and the center of agency. So it has a kind of centrality to it. Um, Seatishness. (laughs) It's a seatishness that's more like a verb, right? Mm -hmm. Then we know that culture, including the culture in your family, then in your classroom, then in the school, and then in the community, and then larger you know, society in which you live, shapes what we call your sense of self. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, that's, right? that's the developmentalism and you know, where the tasks left undone, where they, you know, I mean, the sense of self, you know, anyway, I haven't- Yeah, so, 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 so just to, to stay with that for a moment. So one simple thing to say is that in modern culture, not in indigenous cultures, but mm-hmm. in modern culture, we sadly, especially in the United States of America, mm-hmm. there is an extreme individualism yes. where the self is put in the body or up in the head, just like the mind is thought of only as part of the brain in your head. Mm-hmm. And the problem with this kind of view mm-hmm. is that it's very easy to get threatened. And literally then if we come back to your powerful statement, when there's self protection going on, the feeling of tigers, we pull back our kindness the research absolutely supports what you're saying, Alanis, because what it says is that when we are threatened with you know, limited resources or literally pandemic. the <laughs> pandemic, our, our lives are threatened, mm-hmm. then we quickly do this thing called in-group, out-group discernment. So we say, who's in my in-group, like my family or right. people with my skin color or people in my religion right. or if it's my a tribe. caste system, people in my yeah. level of caste, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then the research is very clear, under threat, and we could talk about how they do the research, you intensify the evaluative process beneath consciousness of you know, who's in my in-group and who's in my out-group, and you are kind and nice and caring to the in-group right. members, but right. you're hostile and sometimes dehumanizing and sometimes you know, killing. Right. Yes. murderous to people in the out group. So what we're yes. seeing in a polarized world, yes. take the United States as one example, Let's but it's not it. just here. <laughs> it's the everywhere. most individualistic country in the world mm. where social media, if you haven't seen the, the, the documentary Social Dilemma, please watch it. You know, it shows the polarization that the social media system has created. Can you, and give now it two, can you t- tell me the two words for the polarization just with social media? Oh, the, they reference them with two. Oh, the, two. oh, the documentary is called Social Dilemma. That's the name well, of the documentary. And the and the the polarization of the polarization what? it creates an in group out group thing. I, I these are my in group. I'm going to hear from them over and over and over again. Right. And the right. out group are terrible, terrible things. Not even right. human beings. Right. And there well, you can. But, yeah. Sorry. I mean, this this is the idea too of the delusion of better than, worse than, right? So this is statusizing when we meet each other. Do I have more money than you? Am I quote unquote better looking than you? Am I taller than you? Am I more svelte or more whatever our culture says is the way to look? Am I more or less than you? So so often when people may meet relationally, socially, it's it's this immediate, often unconscious, quick, quick sort of not competition as much as assessment of who could kill who here, who's better than who here. And so much of that assessment takes away from the direct experience of a relational connection in that moment because the truth of the matter in my direct experience is that we are across from each other some of us are faster runners some of us have more linguistic intelligence some of us have more yeah. you know intrapersonal intelligence so many different howard gardner multiple intelligences and you know and, right. and even beyond the seven or nine there's so many of them i think comedic intelligence is another one spiritual intelligence you know so what was my well, point there? Um, I lost my point, but I'll get it back. Well, but let me build on that, Alanis, yeah. because here, and this gets to what you've said so beautifully about um, the, your own personal work. You know, I'll just give you a quick little example. Elijah Cummings, who was a congressman from Baltimore who recently passed away, 
was uh, an African-American uh, gentleman who was a senior person in the US Congress. And I had the privilege of working with Elijah Cummings in Baltimore, which has the highest rate of murders in the United States. So Elijah and I wanted to bring together black people and white people to see if we could get these folks who had never sat down in the same room to communicate mm -hmm. with each other. So when the meeting started, there was incredible tension, right? Because of the polarization, not just that was happening in that moment in Baltimore, but because of 400 years of slavery and this institutionalized racism. And now we understand if you haven't read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, read it immediately. And I, I read the audio book and the audio book is unbelievable, life-changing. Mm. C-A-S-T-E by Isabel Wilkerson, unbelievable. Mm. So the caste system then, you know, creates this way where we dehumanize the subordinate caste, in this case, blacks who were slaves. So Elijah and I are in the room and, you know, I do this thing that I mentioned earlier, the wheel of awareness. So mm -hmm. there's incredible tension and we do the wheel of awareness mm -hmm. and people basically differentiate the elements of what are knowns, like what you see with your eyes or what you feel in your body, what you think or feel emotionally, you know, mm -hmm. or even your sense of relationships. Those are all points on the rim mm -hmm. from the hub. And when they get in the hub where pure awareness is, mm -hmm. we even have this moment when you bend the spoke around right into the hub. <laughs> now, I wrote a whole book on this called Aware, but the bottom line is in that room with Elijah Cummings, people came out of the meditation, and this is the one I've invited people to do, which has the three pillars in it, but the wheel mm -hmm. of awareness gives you a chance to get to pure awareness. Yes. The tension dissolved away. Nice. And people started crying and talking about how they've never felt so much love, mm. interconnection, and this kind of presence, this awareness, this open awareness. Elijah mm. was like blown away. <laughs> and we started talking about how now the meeting could begin. And when I did a two-day talk with Dick Schwartz on comparing his form of therapy, IFS, internal yeah. family systems, with the framework for knowledge, you know, interpersonal neurobiology, IPNB, is not a form of therapy, it just informs all therapies and just ways mm -hmm. of knowing. So we take the IPMB practice of the wheel and there with Elijah, he's going, oh my God, what happened? And when I did the two day conference with Dick, it turns out his capital S self mm -hmm. has exactly the qualities of the hub. Yes, the, the C's, the creativity, the, the compassion, the, well, that seed of yeah. awareness when we are living, and this, this is, the embodiment conversation of how to embody what is the felt sense there's two i mean egoically you know you said uh, difficulty or challenge in having a felt sense of self you know even though there's a big self operating in all of us um so the i call it the the lowercase self is all the selves all these multitudinous parts in us and the capital s self is that lived embodied awareness and I notice the C's that the, the hub that you speak of, the, the C words that Richard speaks of, um, the idea of just physicalized sensation of awareness, you know, because yeah. I, can, I can be in this felt sense of awareness, oneness, non-dual, and then bringing it into the body because we're still here in theory. Right. So, so for me, this is the epicenter of what I was excited to, to at least dance around with you in this conversation. Yeah. The idea of if we want to support people in feeling this felt sense of what it, you know, even describing it, like when I'm in the hub or when I'm in the C words, there's a, a, a benevolent neutrality. There's a warmth, you know, for me, I think in terms of color a lot. So there's a lot of color. Things are much slower. Um, I've accessed, you know, messages for lack of a better term or um, insights come very quickly. And, um, you know, and yeah. for me, the, the ways to get there, you know, the, the incredible, um, the wheel process, what is it called? The full term? The, the wheel of awareness. Oh, the wheel of yeah. awareness, um, uh, separating parts out that are attempting to be in the driver's seat. I think about the idea, and I, and I shared this the other day, that my husband and I, when we start getting kind of bickery with each other, we basically say to each other, 
who am I talking to? <laughs> yeah, you know, because when so, when our capitalist selves are talking with each other, it is the word, the beautiful harmony word that you use. Yeah. So if there's unrest or their toes being stepped on, which is a natural part of two human beings attempting to relate, but we quickly ask like, who's in the room here, right? And if we can slowly create space and differentiate and in, in Richard's terms, ask them to take a seat and stand by, um, and just keep getting back to self. And the way that I know that I'm in self is that I do feel all the seas, the creativity, the warmth, the curiosity too. Because when I think about the most challenging part of society, it's the lack of empathy and lack of curiosity, which mm -hmm. is which is such um, which is such a, a mechanism for relational sense of connection. So those oh. two things, I'm pretty obsessed with talking about what. What can, I mean, obviously trauma recovery work in the multiple forms. There's so many incredible models and, and forms of therapy that can bring us to this place. And each of us have a uniquely, you know, a different constellation of how it looks for us. And yeah. how it works for us. also depending upon our age and what phase of our life that we're in. And um, Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's so exciting. And um, I want to remember, it, it, we've talked about this, but to invite everyone, if you want to, we have a, a weekly community meeting of people mm -hmm. saying, just this question you're asking, mm -hmm. what can we bring to the world <clears throat> yeah. to help yeah. people resolve unresolved trauma, mm -hmm. to help people directly address the trauma of the pandemic? Yes. So we call it the PEP community, where it's the personal experience of the planetary pandemic but now we've kind of moved into these larger issues of the personal exploration of planetary possibilities. So that's the acronym. <laughs> that, you know, your, acronym. Acronym. your acronym tendencies. <laughs> so, so we ask this question, we say, what can we do with the disruption of the pandemic so we can help people resolve traumas, so we can help deal with the trauma of the pandemic and work as a community. And so one of the things that we're working on is that modern culture has taught essentially a lie the lie that the self is separate. Right. So you could call it just, you know, an incomplete story, or you mm -hmm. could call it a lethal lie. It's yeah, lethal it's because lethal. <laughs> people are so isolated, so anxiety, lonely. depression, suicide, lonely, lonely yes. going yes. up. And the way we dip cellular loneliness. Yes. What's that? Yes. This existential cellular loneliness, even in the company of other people. Exactly. And so we need to combat that loneliness. And the way we're differentiating ourselves from other species is destroying biodiversity. It's destroying the planet. So when and you look not, at- Let's not call that differentiation even. Let's call that disconnect, right? Because well, that's disconnect. Right. So well, the complete, disconnect complete differentiation without linkage would be disconnect. Yeah. Out. Yeah, okay. yeah, right, because you say humans are the only species that matter. Who cares about the other beings on life, right? Yeah, as if so, we can't. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, this as is the thing we're about to destroy. Right, we're, yeah. we're made so, are the planet, yeah. So here's what we think about the planet. We think that you have a body and an embodied experience called a me. You have a relational experience connecting to other people on the planet as a we. And to integrate them, you want to hold them both without losing the integrity of each one. So me right. plus we for us is we, M-W-E. And we have this we community that's saying, what if after the pandemic, and this is the PEP we have meetings we do every week, what if after the pandemic, we can move the evolution of modern culture from the lie, the lethal lie of the separate self Yes. To the more integrated we experience of selfing. And it's so exciting to it say is. that even in the face of the suffering and the loss of lives and livelihoods, we might find through the ashes a way to rise up and be a different kind of humanity. And kindness is basically integration made visible. So I think the reason kids show it and that we have to cultivate it after unlearning it is right. that integration made visible is kindness, compassion, and love. And so mm -hmm. what we want to do through the we integration is let that be a natural way kids are raised by parents, taught mm -hmm. in schools, and then mm -hmm. live in society. Nice. Um, yeah. Sorry, I got to take a deep breath around that one. Just thinking about unschooling and schooling, you know, for a period of time, I just felt really alone in, in this approach 
of unschooling basically. And um, now that it's pandemic time, I've, there've been more conversations had about it and the idea of, of allowing each unique person to be pulled, you know, that natural state of curiosity and that natural state of joy before it becomes snuffed out and indoctrinated out of us. And then, and then we can work our way back into integrating again. Um, for me, it's, you know, as best as we can as caregivers and parents and teachers to attempt not to snuff that out as much as is as used to be the case. And, and when you talk about individualism, and I think about the fact that it's also part of the feminist movement, it's part of all these um, consciousness, so-called evolution, um, where after the Second World War, people went, all the men went to war for, for, for the most part, men bodies, and women thought, oh, I can do what they used to do here and I'll do it all. I, you know, I can do anything a man can do, only better story at the time for feminism. It was a very autonomous time. So weakness was associated with relationality and vulnerability and asking even a question was, was considered weakness, you know, and then it slowly graduated to this place where autonomy was great in terms that afforded a sense of agency or power, um, but it didn't, it didn't make for a lot of love. It didn't make for a lot of senses of connection. So I love that you're, so much of the focus of your work is in bringing this integration back together. And you know, I don't know if there's any value in us talking about the, the various ways that that can happen. I know that um, people coming to, to visit you on your website or to watch you speak and teach, there's a, there's a direct explanation on how we can do that. Um, but if, if this service from these meetings that you're having, this service of helping people reconnect to this sense of oneness without it being amorphous, dis, you know, confusing concepts that, that preclude us from being able to actually physically feel this sense of connection. Because when you look at a bird or you look at a, a dog or you look at the earth or you look at your friends or you look at your enemies, for lack of a better term, it's so easy to feel disconnected because of the skin, because of the, the, the separateness story that we've been taught, right? So, so it's dismantling this story of separateness, but science is so fun in this for me because it corroborates everything that we know about oneness, right? There's all these corroborations and um, confirmations of the fact that we're all made of the same stardust, we're all made of the same, and that this differentiation is, you tell me if I'm right or wrong here, the, um, the energy movement and the, and the density of certain things, even with music or human bodies or tables, the speed with which all the energy is moving can have it appear that we are separate and you're over there and I'm over here, but the, but the energy is all one. So it's almost yeah. like well, for people to understand that we're one, because so many people are really committed to this, not only differentiated, but that person over there murders people. So I am not I am not them. I am not connected to them. I'm one with those four people, like you said, in the cast, but I'm one with this tribe, but I am not one with them. So it's not so much that we're looking around the planet and saying, I act exactly how everyone acts. It's that the, and this is IFS shadow, Jungian, Debbie Ford stuff too, is that anything I see out there, a version of it is in me. It doesn't mean if that person is punching someone, that's my form of disconnect or that's my form of violence. It just means that there is violence in me and I'm either, you know, I'm either uh, acting it out or I'm sublimating it or I'm saying, oh, I don't get angry. You know, when people are like, I'm, I, I'm too old to get angry or whatever it is, I'm just, for me, the invitation to look at all these different parts and realize that whatever we see outside of us is a quality inside of us as well. And that, yeah. that can be one route or one way to link because it's so easy in, in it's, so, it's so easy to think that we are separate when we're in conflict or they believe something we don't, or they're trying to own land that used to be our land. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's really hard in those circumstances when we're bound and there's tigers everywhere to, 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 to sense this oneness. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's so beautiful what you're saying. And um, I think we kind of began with the discussion of embodiment. And it's, it's really 
I think worth just underscoring um, the notion that you are, we are born into a body. Yes. So people who get into the all non-duality thing say, oh, there is no self. Well, actually you do have a body. So let's, yeah, say, you have, let's say you have an inner self, but yes. you also have an inter self. Yes. And then when we, when we embrace those differentiated things, you get a body that gets to live for about, you know, whatever, 100 years on life on this planet. Um, there's an amazing thing, which maybe we'll get into the Q&A, which we're going to start soon. But yeah, there's an amazing way of actually seeing energy, as physicists describe it, as the movement from possibility to actuality. Mm -hmm. And when you dive deeply into this and, you know, where you do this and in the PEP meetings we do this, you know, you realize that the movement from possibility to actuality, in a way, is the movement from this generator of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Make an acronym out of that, of this formless source of all, <laughs> formless source of all form, right? Mm -hmm. It's called the quantum vacuum. You can actually dance between the Newtonian level of macro states where things are like noun-like separate entities into the quantum state where things are verb-like events that are massively interconnected. So mm -hmm. someone heard me talk about this and said, come to Sir Isaac Newton's house and do the wheel of awareness around the apple tree. So we did and a documentary filmmaker made a film of it. And mm -hmm. it was amazing because you can literally, if you do the wheel, you can move between the Newtonian realm of our one reality into the mm -hmm. quantum realm of our one reality, differentiate them and link them so that you come to realize the timelessness where there's no what's called arrow of time and the interconnectedness of the quantum realm is equally as real as the mm -hmm. fact that you have a body. So if you're driving a car and you see a red light, step on the brakes because you mm -hmm. will become one with everything if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty quickly. Uh, Very yes. quickly. So yes. you've got these two things going. And the beautiful thing about integration is that in, in a way it's embracing the paradoxes, right? Yes. The, the infinite, and timeless of the quantum and the fact you have a body step on the brakes. So maybe we, so we I, can end so there. I have, just... a, I have a last question before we jump into Q&A. Yeah, so so what, what of that, everything you just described, what of that when the body dies? You know, yeah. it's so interesting you're saying this because I'm writing a book right now about that. And yeah. um, <laughs> so I, don't, I won't be very articulate because I'm just struggling to find the words. And I wish I was a poet like you or a, Songwriter. Well, I, can, I can give you a couple words for $25. <laughs> okay, you're good. Um, <laughs> that's, that's our next phone call. But, I'm, you know, but as a scientist and a clinician, diving into that question, because what I would say to you and what I say to my patients when they ask me that, we get into these deep existential questions. And I, I think being a therapist is like the biggest privilege in the world. I mean, I am so in honor of the people I work with who. Yes. you know, give me the incredible joy of joining with them on their journey of healing. Mm. And when they ask me that question, we dive in together because we don't have an answer, but I say, well, where were you before you were conceived? Mm -hmm. And I nowadays tell them the story of when my dad was dying and he asked me that question. Mm -hmm. and, and I gave him an answer that relates to some of the stuff we're talking about, about this, this sea of possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and it really gave him a sense of peace that he could drop into that space. And we don't need to get into it now because of time, but, but all I'm going to say is that these ideas are more than just concepts. And while I'm a scientist, so I grounded in science and I write these graduate school textbooks for scientists, I'm also a clinician and an educator and also a dad. So, and, a yeah. and a human being. So, I mean, I've got to <laughs> translate. Yeah. Say it again. You're subject to, to the body dying and all of it, you know? So. Yeah, and all that stuff. So, I mean, what I want to say is that these may seem like heady ideas, but actually when you put them into everyday practice, they're really accessible and actually fun. And they that for me, what they've done is they've given me a, a, a piece about the idea of dying that I've never felt before. Mm. I mean, if, if, it's, if we stay with the quantum physics aspect of, of physicalized individuated body and then the body melting into the earth back into the earth in theory it's still energetic condensed dense cluster of soul that gets dense around the body and i would think that when the body goes that cluster of density remains 
and we can in some ways conjure it if we want to or um yeah, conjure it or, and, and then it also dissipates too. I mean, that's, these are, yeah. these are my thoughts. Well, <laughs> here's, here's some, about that. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just echo that Alanis and say the following thing, you know, and this is what I said to my dad, you know, I, I, he was a mechanical engineer and didn't, you know, he didn't really believe in spirituality. He didn't want to talk about religion. He didn't want to talk about, you know, anything, but then he was dying. And um, literally, it was hours before he was about to die. And no one was talking about it. And he asked me, am I dying? And I looked at his vital signs. I said, Dad, I think you're dying. And mm -hmm. I sat on his bed and um, we held hands. And he said, where am I going to go? I said, I, I have no idea. There's no, <laughs> he goes, where do you think? And I didn't want him to kick me out of the house yet one more time, you know. And uh, so I said, well, <laughs> I, I really don't know. He goes, what's that? The last seven minutes, you're getting kicked out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, this, right. this is, it's been good so far. Let's keep it. He goes, no, 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 tell, me what, <laughs> tell me what you think. And I go, well, there was a time before you were conceived where there were trillions and trillions of eggs and gazillions more of sperm, you know, and of the incredible sea of possibilities mm -hmm. that could generate all the different combinations Amazingly, one sperm and one egg found their way from a sea of possibility into actuality to become the body that was the unique person that you are. And he was a very unique person. And I said, and then you get about a hundred years to live in this unique embodiment mm -hmm. in this body you've had. And he yes. was, you know, approaching 90, you know, mm -hmm. and we were holding hands. And I said, so dad, it could very well be that you get this experience of these actualities that you call the life. Mm. And that whenever it happens, and you're close to 90, you know, you're gonna dissolve back mm. into the deep sea of possibilities. Mm. The, un the unmet. <laughs> his, yeah, and his, his tense face got super relaxed. In fact, I don't think I had ever in my whole life seen him so peaceful. And we're holding hands and he says, thank you that makes me feel, feel so at ease mm. and we talked for more and he was just so calm i had to go and then he died mm. and my mom said he died in peace mm. and so when you talk about you know it, it, when, when you do the wheel and and every morning i do it you know when you get into the hub it is those sea of possibilities i think is from where awareness comes from and I think that's what dying is, is going back where we came from. Yes, yes, amen to that. <laughs> um, we could go, Mark, are you up for opening it up to conversations with? Um, and we can keep on going, Mark, if you want uh, us to do it. Or... <laughs> yeah. Hey there, my, my mouse just stopped working. It was a beautiful, beautiful story, Dan, thank you. Oh, thank you. I think a lot of people in the chat are too. Um, yeah, I've got some questions here from, from our participants. Should I feed you a couple? Sure. Sure. And I, so, I just want to say, as you're getting ready, Mark, Alanis, thank you so much. This was so, so beautiful to do a combo you. with you. That's I love combos with you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the top voted question here. Dan, please finish what you were saying yesterday uh, with the panel regarding intuition versus survival trauma gut feeling that yeah joanne yeah thank you you know the for those who weren't there yesterday the question was how can i distinguish distinguish between uh, uh, intuition and, and gut feelings or heartfelt feelings in the body mm -hmm. versus reactive states of fight flight freeze and faint and you know um it would take a, like about a minute to do so i'll ask alanis if you want to do it but there's a an exercise that gives you a feeling of what that reactivity is like that's usually there um, giving you an edge, even if it's a signal from your heart or a signal from your intestine, it'll have the edge of fight, flight, freeze, or faint. And that's what I was gonna say and do the exercise where, you know, it's a, and I can do it, but it, it, it takes some time. So I don't know if you wanna use the time, but when you do this experience of hearing one word and it's the word no repeatedly said, you feel it in your body. So it's a very embodied exercise. 
And that's a way to distinguish it because that's, that's when you know there's a reactivity going on. You can feel yourself retracting either toward chaos or toward rigidity. And that's the way Amanda's saying, do it, do it. Is it okay if I do it, Alanis? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So it's, just, it's brief, but it does take a bit of time. So, so let's um, just get yourself ready. If you're someone with a history of trauma, just know this can evoke some very intense feelings. So take care of yourself. Close your ears. If you can don't, I, can I um, say one, one thing before you begin, Dan, is the idea yeah. that some people, um, for some people, there's something, I think Peter Levine coined this term of um, anxi uh, meditation induced anxiety or me meditation induced panic, an article that he wrote about some people don't actually benefit from meditation on its own because we're left with these sometimes cruel inner voices or parts that we don't necessarily know how to deal with. So for some people, uh, meditation, guided meditation can help, which is what you're providing right now. I'm also making a guided meditation record and a meditation record for those who might benefit from that. Um, but I just wanna sort of piggyback on what you just said about, for some people meditation can actually be can actually trigger some trauma of being alone. Like I used to go to movies alone quite a bit. And when I would go to the movie theater and the lights would go dark, it would be, that would be the moment where I would have a typical panic attack and I'd have to leave the theater. And it was because everything did get still. So I'm just a big fan right now of guided meditations because we're not left alone with some of the tougher voices before we do CBT or whatever we do with our thoughts, um, <clears throat> period. and. I'm all, I'm all ears, sorry. Yeah, absolutely, that's true. And there's a whole, there's a section in AWARE which talks about a person who was traumatized in her childhood and what it was like to go through the meditation of the wheel. And then mm. you see why that kind of practice of entering the uncertainty of the hub was mm. so terrifying. But then when she did the work with that, it actually mm. became a sanctuary. Yes, instead of the source of panic. Eventually it can. Yeah. yeah, eventually. So, you know, yeah. but you'll see that in that that part of the book. So this is not a guided meditation. It's just sort of an experience. But, mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity to just be aware of your body. And again, to learn from these signals when there's reactivity, basically in the subcortical areas that are holding on to fight, flee, freeze, or faint. Okay, so those are the four Fs we have of reactivity. So just... Take a few deep breaths, and I'm gonna say a word, I'll repeat it several times, then I'll pause, then I'll say another word several times, and then we'll do a couple of other things. So here we go. No. 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 Yes. 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 And now take a nice deep breath and try putting one hand on your chest and one hand on your abdomen. Put some gentle pressure, some nice easy breaths in and out. And now switch your hands around. The hand on your chest goes your abdomen. The one on your abdomen goes your chest. Some gentle pressure, some easy, gentle breaths in and out. And now if you've noticed that one configuration was more comforting than the other, put it in the configuration that was most comforting. And now just take some nice deep breaths. That's great. And now one big deep breath. 
and you can let it go and let your eyes come open if they're closed. And if you're okay, Alanis, I'll ask you if you are up for it, what did, did you notice a difference between no and yes? Yes. And can no. you share with us, <laughs> no, can you share with us what the difference felt like? What, what did one feel like and what did the other feel like? Uh, okay, so no, was a, there was a contraction, there was a, a, a compelling to move away, to even turn my head away, to actually physically leave the room. So that's the flight. Um, there was the tendency to want to lower, you know, just shoulders up, contract, protect, armor. And then yes, um, Yes, there was a warmth that sort of like water went across the whole, my whole torso. My whole torso filled up with warmth and yellow gold. Um, and this, you know, I want to lean, I want to lean toward or lean in. Mm -hmm. um, and sleep. <laughs> mm. Sleep from the armor exhaustion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Great. And then what, how about the hands on the chest and the abdomen? How did that feel? Did that offer anything? Yeah, a lot of comfort on the chest. You know, it just feels like a shield in a way. And it, it's a shield on the outside of the hand. It's a care and warmth and mercy on the inside of the hand. Mm. And then a um, little less access for me in the, in the abdomen area. Mm -hmm. A little working on, you know, postpartum activity, a lot of, a lot of energy around the u uterus <laughs> after mm -hmm. three kids came out of the, the house. <laughs> um, so yeah. there's, a, there's a little bit of nothingness and neutrality in, in that area yeah. that I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And then the switch, tell me about the switch when you, if you want. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm right-handed. So there was a tendency to want to have the most activity in the right hand, but both mm -hmm. felt quite lovely. This one felt a little more foreign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, we, it's interesting. We get about three quarters are right on top, about a quarter left on top. And it's not, de it depends on handedness, interestingly. And for those of you who are still reactive from the no, do some breathing exercises, stretch around, take care of yourself, because it can be a very intense thing worth learning from, but, uh, but good to do. And, you know, when you work with parents, it's really helpful to, to teach parents this for themselves. So they can learn when they're reactive. And you know, to come to the original question, when you feel these elements of contraction that Alana so beautifully talked about, and you can have other things too, it, it can be a sign that what you're experiencing is not intuition, it's reactivity, right? Mm. So you may have a gut reaction, but that's full of reactivity to fight, flight, freeze, or faint. Mm. Whereas a gut reaction that says, oh, you know, I just have a bad feeling about this person working for us or there's something about what this friend said that just doesn't feel right in my heart. Mm. You know, I, I, let me check it out. And so often, especially if it comes up three times as a therapist, I'll even say, I don't know what's going on right now, but I've just kind of got this real heaviness in my heart. And then my patient will start crying and it'll be just the issue that someone didn't feel something with them or something where we get so tuned in. You mentioned mirror neurons the other day. You know, we get so tuned into each other that knowing this yes, no experiment, Tina Payne Bryson and I wrote a whole book for parents on this called The Yes Brain, which mm -hmm. teaches you how to actually try to bring more of a yes state into a child's life. So anyway, that's yeah. enough, I think, for this question in these and four did, minutes. That was yeah. so beautiful, Dan. And you, you've done some, I remember speaking with you at UCLA and uh, improv um, with Betsy yeah. and Zoe and... Um, the idea of yes and I mean for us in our house it is all about yes and because even if it's you know I want to take this mud and throw it right at your face mom I'll say yes yes that would be satisfying wouldn't it <laughs> yes, exactly yes and, no matter what's presented you know and and the warmth of the yes that was the felt physical fear experience of of that liquid warmth I mean I just think about flowers and orchids and, and they can't grow it while you're hitting them or while you're knowing them. Exactly. exactly. The light and the warmth and the energy. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, and it's so, it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. The, the, the growth of those flowers, Alanis, so, that's exactly right. And, 
you know, to create a yes set of relationships uh, is that the, the improv yes end. And sure. it doesn't mean, yeah. you know, there have been some misperceptions around, oh, you know, oh, there's just a boundarylessness. No, 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 there's a boundary is absolutely intact. It's just the energy of, yes, of course, ultimate validation and empathizing. And then yeah. if there's something to shift or discuss, we can do that later. And I love yeah, what yeah. you're doing right now. I mean, I always love what you're talking about. I love the idea of getting familiar with the felt sense of the reactivity. What does anger feel like in my body? We did an exercise when I was teaching at 1440 Multiversity where I, we were all separated in the room and standing there. And I would just, I would say a feeling, you know, to, to see not only, not, not only to invite what that sensation feels like of that word. So the word could be fear, the word could be frustration, the word could be numb, and that we could physicalize it in the room, on the floor, We'd, we all had our separate space, um, to become more familiar with what it is and, and have that embodied bottom-up experience where we don't necessarily have to know. Like as a kid, I used to say to my parents all the time, why am I crying? Why am I crying? You know, my sweet children, mom, why? why am I crying? You know, and, and to be able to say, tell me where you feel it in your body. Because when I first started doing trauma recovery work, I didn't understand the point of naming the sensation or the prickly or the purple or the cold or the numb. I didn't understand the benefit of that. Mm. But now there's a whole world of language and awareness of my reactivity, awareness that something's up, awareness that a dialogue might need to happen within with one or two or multiple parts. So I'm seeing the great gift of, of what you just offered everyone over the last few minutes of, of recognizing sensation in our body versus having to intellectually understand everything, which was my very much a big part of my survival strategy. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Okay, folks, we're almost out of time. Maybe time for one quick one. Um, Chantal asks, what is your favorite trauma tool for yourself by yourself? Ooh. Mm. So Mark, say it again, what's your favorite trauma tool for yourself, by yourself? Yeah, I read this question as what's a tool you use for yourself that you can do on your own without a therapist? Oh, got it. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, go, you can go for it, Dan. I'll, I'll, I mean, you I know, I, I know you're saying one thing, but I'll say three things. Um, I mean, the first thing is to really relationally make a repair if there's been a rupture and connection with my wife or my kids or my mom or anybody to really realize that, you know, relationships are who we are. And when there's a rupture, rather than getting mad at yourself, realize that's what it, it's about. And the repair process as Ed Tronic beautifully has taught us is really what it's about. So that's the first thing of the three I'm going to quickly say as the one. So re it's relational right. is what you do with someone else, relational repair, mm -hmm. reconnection. The second I'll say is that you know, I do the wheel of awareness every day and I add a little component to it that I call a fantastic practice. And it's an acronym for free association <laughs> now um, to allow sensation of the body, sensation, truth. So the true stuff to come out, integration and curiosity. So it spells the word fantastic. But, it, you know, people always have a bad rap they give, um, you know, to mind wandering. But intentional mind wandering is really uh, healthy for you. So, <laughs> so the fantastic crap, free association now to allow sensation, truth, uh, integration of curiosity. So you can do that. So I do that with the wheel. I add that to the wheel when, if there's something traumatic that happened or I'm working on, I'll do the wheel with the fantastic practice during the third segment of the room. And the last thing I'll say is journal writing. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the incredible research on journaling your gratitude for life, writing mm -hmm. three things every day you're grateful for, but also just journaling about things that are tough. And even if you never read it again or never show it to anybody, the act of writing is therapeutic. There's beautiful research on that. Yeah, the long hand. Remember pens? Um, yes. <laughs> remember pens. Um, Here's my pen. <laughs> I have one. I use it. Um, for me, the, the one or two or three, I love the relationship one. So if there is some unrest to repair, because it's, I think about it with my kids too. I'll be riddled with guilt for something I said or didn't say in any given moment. And um, so I, my husband just keeps reminding me, he's like, honey, just go repair it. Quick repair, quick repair. And it is, you know, a lot of studies now have shown that it's not about the, the violating the boundary by accident or whatever it is. It's about the repair. Um, and if there's a whole malevolent, whatever that even means, but if there's 
I'm going to stop talking there. My other uh, favorite way is warmth. Anything warm. I'm a highly sensitive um, and an empath. Um, and really that I benefit from ocean ions and warmth. And, um, and then the presence practice, as I call it, just sitting there noticing. I might notice the thoughts racing. I notice the... Um, I notice my breath, if it's shallow, I notice the jaw. I just had a teeth replaced for having cracked in half from clenching the jaw so much. So a lot of dissociation in my face. <laughs> so I've been doing all this work to come back into my body after healing from eating disorders. And, and I realized that I had left my skull in my head out. <laughs> so there's been a lot of investigation into the jaw for sure. Um, and breath work and hugs, 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 hugs. Hugs feels like a good place to start to wrap this up. <laughs> ah, virtual hugs. <laughs> yeah, I miss hugs. Hmm. Okay, thank you both. Um, a few things to wrap up. Someone asking here, clarify uh, the library options are, they're in the currency, they're in US dollars. US dollars. Yeah, so not British pounds, US dollars. So don't be fooled by the accent. Um, if you do want the whole library, it's there. Remember, if you do work um, in the trauma field and you can't afford it, then send us a message and we'll help you out. Um, I'm too tired to do a sales pitch for it, but it's, it's bloody brilliant. So just get it. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's a pitch. There you go. There's my pitch. It's really good. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, the Facebook group still exists and there'll be breakout rooms after this for those of you. Um, who would like to chat to each other the breakout rooms are nice actually it's just nice just I was in one earlier it's a pleasant human contact even on zoom so if you're feeling a bit lonely that might be a nice place to go or maybe something got stirred up a little bit from this so I recommend those um thank you to Steve our late night host much appreciated if you want a fun session in half an hour my friend Colin Hall is doing the worst yoga class in the world um, <laughs> Um, we, he was going to do something serious. We're like, no, Colin, we, we're going to do a fun one. Um, Eddie Stern, yoga legend later on. Uh, Paul Linden from, um, he works with trauma from a very particular, uh, unusual point of view around martial arts. I recommend Paul Linden's session. Um, Samuel Bonda, Angel Williams is this time tomorrow. And later on in the, in the conference, we have a keynote from Ken Wilbur, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Cornfield. <laughs> John Cabot zinn Martha Eddy. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, Rick Hansen, Stephen Porges. I mean, it's, it's an absolute festival. Uh, this, I believe, though, is the last one that Alanis uh, is on. She's been extremely generous with her time. Uh, if she ever wants to come back, we'll certainly host you again. Alanis, it's much appreciated that you've um, been so generous and shared of yourself. It's, um, you know, it's meant a lot to me and I know to many of the team as well. So, um, yeah, oh, we so really it's appreciate a pleasure that. to be here. An honor to be here as, as uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think of Dan, I think of Dan, you sitting in the front seat at UCLA, you're a teacher and a student archetypally. And I, I feel so privileged because I get to philosophize and, and, and dive deeply um, in these conversations. And I also get to be a student. And if there's something to share, I can teach too. So it's, it's an incredible combination. I feel so grateful to be here. Thank you. Very sweet. Sweet. Dan, I, I'm so sorry for mispronouncing your surname earlier. 25 years of Aikido, I, I had a seagull in my head, not seagull. <laughs> so, that, no worry. My, 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 I did actually know, I've studied your work for a few years, but it just went in my tired brain. So apologies for that, sir. And I want to give the final word of the session for you. We'll put it in our book. Uh, top embodiment tip, one sentence or less, Dan. You know, just be kind to yourself and kindness will arise for others. You know, but begin inside and let the love spread. Thank you, Dan. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll wrap it up there. I'll see you later today or tomorrow, whatever day we're in now. I really have no idea. So um, have a wonderful <laughs> day, evening, life, everyone. Cheers again, Steve. Thank you. Um,